Hey, ready to ready to roll, Paul? Right. Yeah, I got some good pictures. Take your time, Paul. We're not no rush. All right. Welcome back, everybody, uh, to the Hearst Seventh Day Adventist Church live stream. And to those of you who are in person, we thank you for being here today. We are continuing our series with Pastor Dennis Preby on the mission of the church. What is the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Why are we here? And why does it matter? So that's uh, what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. We're going to be looking at um, how inspired was Ellen White. And before we get, I turn the time over to Pastor Preby, we'll have a word of prayer. And so if you bow your heads with me right now. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us this great opportunity again to come together, to fellowship and to Uh, to learn more about what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, Lord. And I pray that we'd be revived and refreshed by these messages, Lord, that as we we, uh, hear the the words spoken, Lord, that they would sink deep into our heart and settle uh, settle us into the truth, Father. I thank you for blessing us already today. May your spirit go before us. Speak through Pastor Preby, and may we be touched with with a word from on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor? Right, that better. We not may not be many, but again, I did mean what I said about this being one of my most, my most, my, yeah, my most pres- important presentation. I firmly believe. Now, here's the point: it's not me. This is not about me. I firmly believe that those who have a clear understanding of this subject that we're going to cover this afternoon will undoubtedly make it through the time of trouble that's coming up. And those who do not have a clear understanding, that's irrelevant to whether they're here right now. They may have their own clear understanding. That's fine. Those who do not have a clear understanding of what we're going to talk about this afternoon probably will not make it. It's that important. I think this is a make or break subject uh, for, for, uh, for survival through the deceptions. Yes, let's hand those out right now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of those subjects that uh, if you're unclear about, you're going to be fooled by Satan somewhere down the line. We're not smart enough for Satan. We're not. Have you figured that out? He's smarter than we are. Yeah, if you want extras, by all means... I have extras as well, uh, Pastor, so. Thank you. All right, extras, absolutely. Pastor, you need I have I have plenty. I, I do have plenty, so I've got extras. Okay, we've had prayer. We're ready to go. Here's the first question I'm going to ask. This comes from a general conference president of past years. He's retired, and, uh, and he, asked this que- he says, This question lies at the root, root of most denominational tensions. Do we have some denominational tensions right now? This question lies at the root of most denominational tensions. What shall we do with Ellen White? What shall we do with Ellen White? And he says the, quest, the, the, the key word affecting one's answer to this question is the question of authority. What authority do her writings have over my daily living? What authority do they have? Um, 
I'm going to read you something now which lets you know that uh, there, this is a serious issue. In North America, we have about a 17% reader population for the spirit of prophecy books. I did say 17. I did not say 70. 17% readership, meaning that people read them fairly regularly, fairly often, morning, evening, whenever. 17% readership, and most of those readers are over the age of 65. Wow. Most of those readers are over the age of 65. It's not, he says, that we don't have access to Ellen White books. We're just choosing not to read them. Because have you noticed that they are more specific than the Bible? You know, the Bible gives general principles. You have to sort it out to what was going on at that time. Does that apply today? Uh, and all kinds of things. Ellen White writes for today's language. Yes, I know she passed away in 1915, but this is today. Uh, what our problems are in 2025, uh, or 24, <laughs> whatever we're in, 24, uh, are the same problems that we had yeah. earlier. So this is writing for today, and that's why sometimes we're not uh, clear. He, the same person who was writing this said, If new members are not oriented as to why we're Seventh-day Adventists and what motivates us as a church, if they don't understand the great controversy theme, if they don't see the emphasis that God has given us through the writings of Ellen White, then we're going to have a lot of people who don't really understand why they're Seventh-day Adventists and who may not be fully prepared to stand true to God in the last days. All right, now, first thing I'm going to do is not talk about Ellen White. I'm going to talk about preachers like your pastor and me. If you go to just about any theological seminary for training, including our own, you are going to find a whole shelf of books, not one or two books, a whole shelf of books on one subject, the search for the historical Jesus. That sounds like a great subject, doesn't it? The search for the historical Jesus. Couldn't be anything wrong with that. Except when you examine who's writing it and what their motivation is. Because, you see, most of the ones, in fact, I'm going to say all of the ones who attend these, these uh, conventions that are held regularly, uh, all of them believe that uh, when you're searching through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're getting a nice general picture of Jesus, but not the whole picture. You're just not getting the total, the total thing about what he was doing. In fact, some of those miracles that he uh, performed, some of the um, object lessons that he gave, some of the illustrations, he may not have given at all. They may have gotten inserted into the biblical canon, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at a later date of 100, 200 years later. And they got part of the book. And therefore, we assume that it's all kosher, all good, all true. And uh, so these uh, gentlemen and ladies get together twice a year. At least they have been doing that. I don't know if they're doing it right now. They, have, they get together. They present papers. They talk about things together, and they try to get to the, the search for the historical Jesus as a, as a group effort. Uh, let's see what, uh, what, I, what I found in, in a description of this. A letter came to, the, uh, to Ministry Magazine from a pastor, not Adventist, in the mid-states. We're mid-states, aren't we? We're right in the middle of the whole United States. And this pastor wrote this. Um, God lies beyond our understanding and calls us to trust his spirit to lead us beyond the place that we can see clearly. Whether I accept Daniel, the book, as the product of verbal inspiration in the 7th century or spiritual inspiration in the 2nd century doesn't really matter. Okay, you, what do you think about that? Good statement? Wow. If he's writing in the 7th century, his words are prophecy. If he's writing in the 2nd century, his words are 
history palming off as prophecy. I'd say there's a tremendous amount of difference in whether someone is writing in the 7th century or the 2nd century talking about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Okay? Also says, whether I accept Esther, the book, as history, legend, or folktale doesn't really matter either. We don't know if it's history. You know, the problem with Esther, the word name God isn't used in it. You've been studying that in your Sabbath school lessons. The Bible, he says, is the sole authority, authority, keyword, for faith and practice, not because it is factual or even because it is true, but because God has spoken through it to us and still does so by his spirit. What do you think about that as a conclusion? Not true. Well, what books are true and what books are not true? We'll have to sort that out. We'll figure that one out. But... Uh, uh, once again, some strange, strange beliefs, and these are attracting many ministers of the gospel. The, the, the sessions have been pretty... Yeah, it is. And by the way, if you do have questions along the way, we're a small enough group that we can entertain the questions that you might have, so do interrupt me if you want to. But, <laughs> but Desmond Ford was saying that not everything there is of the same value. That's correct. All right, I'm going to read something here that is going to start us off with our regular subject. Patriarchs and Prophets 357 and 358. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. Now, who believes that in the Christian world today? Nobody. Nobody. When, you're, when you've confessed your sin, it is gone. Remember that, that, that bottom of the ocean and the east and the west? It's just gone. No, what those texts are trying to tell us is God doesn't remember them anymore. God doesn't hold them against us anymore. Our guilt is gone. But the sin stands on record because you might go back to it. And once you go back to it, everything comes back. Not just the good things you did, but the bad things as well and the sins. So the whole, the whole thing waits until something called a final judgment, and that is unique to Adventism too. Okay, in the type, this great work of atonement or blotting out of sins was represented by the services of the Day of Atonement. That's our real issue today. What is going on in the Day of Atonement that makes a huge difference? Or another statement or two from Ellen White first. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 575. All need to become, all keyword, need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare people to stand in the great day of God, and their efforts will be successful. Did you catch all of that, I, what I just read? First of all, she does not call it a truth. She calls it a grand truth. She doesn't use that phrase very often. When this grand truth is seen and understood, when this truth, what we're talking about now, is seen and understood, then what's going to happen? Their efforts will be not a failure, successful. Their efforts will be successful. Okay? Testimonies, Volume 5, 575. Why is all this important? Aren't we doing a pretty good job of reaching the people out there, let's say in the 1040 window, trying to help, help them? Are we having a hard time? Am I not coming through well? No, I, seriously. All right. Do I need to put on this, the other microphone or is it all, all right? I'm going to ask your judgment. All right. Listen up then. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi. What a person. What an experience. I like your Christ, he said. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And there's a man, I'm going to leave the, uh, the judgment up to, up to God as to whether he's going to be saved or lost. But he should, have be, he should be saved. That's the kind of person you want in heaven. And, uh, and, but Christians, Christians discouraged him. Here's the one even maybe more serious. 
One is a very precocious 12-year-old. He reads his Quran regularly and prays five times a day. He takes part in religious discussions at the local mosque and is a moving force among the young people there. I asked him if he had always been a Muslim. No, I used to belong to a Christian church right here in Cuba, he told me. What about your family, I asked. Oh, they are still going to that church, but they are also sometimes coming to the mosque with me. Why did you decide to become a Muslim, I asked. He looked at me very seriously and said, I was looking for a religion that had higher standards and clear answers to my questions. Two things, higher standards. His, the Christians he saw were pretty loose in their standards. And clear answers to my questions. What are we doing here? What's going on? How will this whole thing end up? This is from a Seventh-day Adventist pastor a long time ago. I'm talking about probably 70 years ago. The concept of the final atonement. Now, that's our subject today. What is it? What? Yeah, but we're not talking about the spirit of prophecy for a minute. No. No, I know, I know. We'll, we will discuss the final atonement, but no, this is, not, this is right now and right here. <laughs> Matthew knows my presentations pretty well. <laughs> the concept of the final atonement, which is what we're going to talk about, day of atonement, final atonement, is the one and only contribution that Adventists have made in Christian theology. There must be a refusal to be embarrassed with this peculiar teaching. Have we gotten embarrassed with this teaching? What is going to happen on the final atonement? What is God, God going to do in the end of time? Many now teach, listen up, that the saints will not be sinless until the second advent of Christ, but such a teaching must result in casting aside the doctrine of a cleansed sanctuary before Jesus comes. Casting aside the teaching of the cleansed sanctuary. It must lead to a rejection of the final atonement in the most holy place, and the special sealing to take place in the minds of the 144,000. So all kinds of subjects are involved in this particular understanding that we're going to talk about. And Ellen White really makes a difference here. What a difference she makes, because the Bible doesn't talk very much about the final atonement. A few chapters in Leviticus, uh, some that Jesus gave, but not a lot. All right, so here we are. Christian leaders discouraging us from studying the Bible for ourselves. Come to our meetings and we'll sort it out for you. Which books are inspired, which books are not so much, and does it make any difference? That's really what they're saying. All right, you have your outlines now, right? Amen. Now we'll pick up with Ellen White. I'm not going to read everything. You have them in front of you. I'll let you know where I am so you'll be able to follow with me. Third paragraph on the first page, Call, Call Porter Ministry, page 125. Sister White is not the originator of these books. They contain the instruction that during her life work God has been giving her. They contain the precious comforting light that God has graciously given his servant to be given to the world. Uh, <clears throat> so, her claim. Notice her claim very carefully. Next paragraph, Testimonies, Volume 5, 67. I do not write one article in the paper expressing merely my own ideas. They are what God has opened before me in vision, the precious rays of light shining from the throne. Testimonies, Volume 5, 67 again. Weak and trembling, I arose at 3 o'clock in the morning to write to you. God was speaking through clay. You might say that this communication was only a letter, Yes, it was a letter, but prompted by the Spirit of God to bring before your minds things that had been shown me. In these letters which I write, in the testimonies I bear, I am presenting to you that which the Lord has presented to me. See, now the question we're asking, and this is the whole question of this afternoon, can we trust what Ellen White says? I'm not going to give you a presentation on why I believe Ellen White is a prophet. You'll have to make that decision on your own. I am going to ask the question, now, what authority do her writings have? If she is a prophet, yeah. what authority do her writings have over my daily life, the things I, I, I function with? Testimonies, Volume 4, page 230. 
God is either teaching his church, reproving their wrongs, and strengthening their faith, or he is not. This work is of God, or it is not. God does nothing in partnership with Satan. My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are of the spirit of God or of the devil. Wow. You know what? I like plain talking. I like it when someone says, this is the way it is. You can choose this way. You can choose this way. Wow. I make the final decision. I appreciate that, even though that was a pretty strong way to say it. The testimonies are of the spirit of God or of the devil. One way or the other, there's no halfway work in the matter. Yes. All right, Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 68. Many times in my experience, I have been called upon to meet the attitude of a certain class. All right, what class? Who acknowledged that the testimonies were from God, but took the position that this matter and that matter were Sister White's opinion and judgment. This so suits those who do not love reproof and correction and who, if their ideas are crossed, have occasion to explain the difference between the human and the divine. Isn't that exactly what our friends in the scholarly world have been doing with the, with the Gospels? Telling you what parts of it are human, telling you what parts of it are divine. If the preconceived opinions or particular ideas of some are crossed in being reproved by testimonies, they have a burden at once to make plain their position to discriminate between the testimonies, defining what is Sister White's human judgment and what is the word of the Lord. Everything that sustains their cherished ideas is divine, and the testimonies to correct their errors are human. Sister White's opinions. They, please notice the last sentence. They, do, it does not say deny. They make of none effect the counsel of God by their tradition. You got it. No, no, that's precisely what I was hoping someone would remember. What is the last deception for the Seventh-day Adventist church? To make of none effect. So what is making of none effect? If you would ask any of these Bible scholars I have referenced to, uh, do you uh, believe in the Bible? What do you think their answer would be? Man, I've given my life to its study. I have sacrificed uh, uh, maybe paychecks. I am, yes, 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 we believe in the Bible. But as we define it, as we limit it, as we choose. And usually, isn't it usually that the parts that are kind of set aside are the parts that step on one's toes? Have you noticed that about us, you and me? We tend to set aside things that cut across the way we like to do things. And uh, that be, most theology, let me throw this in, most theology is by experience, not by the word of God. Most theological decisions have been made by personal experience, not by what God says in his word. That's why we have so many gospels. All right, let's see what else we have. Testimonies, volume five, 691. Do not, by your criticisms, take out all the force, all the point and power from the testimonies. Do not feel that you can dissect them to suit your own ideas, claiming that God has given you ability to discern what is light from heaven and what is the expression of mere human wisdom. Here it is. If the testimonies speak not according to the word of God, reject them. Christ and Belial, Satan, cannot be united. Don't just reject that paragraph. Don't re re reject that line, reject them, because the whole issue is do the counsels of God have authority for us today? Couldn't that have been said to any prophet speaking for God? How about Jeremiah? Couldn't they have said something like that to him? Couldn't they have said things like that to, uh, to John the Baptist? I think uh, probably the advisors from King Herod's court suggested the, the way he should talk at that last meeting, but he said no. Testimonies, Volume 5, 691. Do not, by your criticisms, take out all the force, all the point and power from the testimonies. Do not feel that you can dissect them to suit your own ideas, claiming that... Did I just read that? Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought it was sounding mighty familiar. Volume 3, Selected Messages, page 70. In the testimony sent to Battle Creek, I have given you the light God has given to me in no case... Have I given my own judgment or opinion? I have enough to write of what has been shown me without falling back on my own opinions. I imagine that was very true 
for Ellen trying to decide what parts to write out, what parts to speak. Uh, yeah. Now, I'm going to share something with you right here that is not in your outline. This is from Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 70. I have my work to do, she said, to meet the misconceptions of those who suppose themselves able to say what is testimony from God and what is human production. If those who have done this work continue in this course, what course? What's from God? What's from man? If those who have done this work continue in this course, satanic agencies will choose for them. Those who have helped souls to feel at liberty to specify what is of God in the testimonies and what are the uninspired words of Sister White will find that they were helping the devil in his work of deception. We have been doing, I hate to say it, we have been doing what the, our scholarly friends have been doing. Maybe not quite at the same level they're doing it, but we've been doing it. Well, she didn't say, I saw this in a vision. So that probably is not authoritative. That's probably your own words. Or something else that we've defined how you tell what is inspired and what is not. All right, turn the page. Page two. Permit me to express my mind and yet not my mind, but the word of the Lord. Councils to Writers, 112. All right, here's an interesting one. Selected Messages, volume three, page 51. I have no light on the subject as to just who would constitute the 144,000. Please tell my brethren that I have nothing presented before me regarding the circumstances concerning which they write, and I can set before them only that which has been presented to me. Selected Messages, volume three, page 51. I am not at liberty. Okay, this person is an interesting one. He's a pastor coming from somewhere way away from Northern California where she was retired in a beautiful vineyard and area. Um, he'd come from somewhere like Iowa asking, what should I do with the rest of my life? I am not at liberty to write to our brethren concerning your future work. I have received no instruction regarding the place where you should locate. If the Lord gives me definite instruction concerning you, I will give it you, but I cannot take upon myself responsibilities that the Lord does not give me to bear. Keep issue for a prophet. Here's what a prophet's got to do. I'm so glad I'm not a prophet. I can give you my opinion on any subject under the sun, and you will understand it as that, my opinion, except for what I'm reading right here. And so what does a prophet do? What can a prophet do? I'm maybe not even talking about a minister. A minister can give their own opinions too. That has not been forbidden them. But you see, the difference between a minister or teacher and a prophet, a minister or teacher works with the word of God. A prophet gives the word of God. That's the difference. And that's why a prophet dare not give his or her opinion. Elijah was not to give any opinions to King Ahab but only the word of the Lord. A prophet has to be really restrictive. No opinions allowed. Because easily that could be understood as the word of the Lord. That's the way the man would take it, right? You should go over here and work in Tennessee. That's your place that, uh, that uh, the Lord has showed me. What do you think he would take that as? Direct connection with God. And he would go there because the prophet said yes. That's the key issue at this point. That is the key issue. Can we take anything that she says as God's word that we must live our lives by and will face again in the judgment one way or the other? Now, remember now, we've all broken the Bible rules. We've all broken Ellen White's rules. We've all done it. Can we be forgiven at any point? 100% forgiveness at any point even when we've been pastors as long as you and I have been, we can still be forgiven. <laughs> I've got a lot more to take care of. <laughs> and so, yes, God will forgive, but we are required to be responsible to it. We can't ignore it. 
Okay, let's see what else we have here. I think I'm going to skip the next one, and we're going to go down to Danger of Rejection, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 42. It does not become anyone to drop a word of doubt here and there that shall work like poison in other minds, shaking their, their confidence in the messages which God has given, which have aided in laying the foundation of this work, and have attended to the present day in reproofs, warnings, corrections, and encouragements. To all who have noticed, stood in the way of the testimonies, blocking them. I would say God has given a message to his people, and his voice will be heard whether you hear or forbear me or forbear. Your opposition has not injured me, but you must give an account to the God of heaven who has sent these warnings and instructions to keep his people in the right way. You will have to answer to him for your blindness, for being a stumbling block in the way of sinners. That's her answer to the question you just posed, that yes, we will face each of these issues again when God judges each of our decisions. Now remember, the people in heaven that will be there will not all be all of the same understanding of what is truth and what is not truth. Will there be people in heaven that believe that the soul goes to heaven immediately at death? Yes, there will. Will there be people in heaven who believe that hell is an eternally burning fire? Yep. There will be lots of kindergarten classes in heaven. But God will let some in, and the word some is important, who have demonstrated that they are willing to learn and change. Learn and change. And he will allow people to sit in kindergarten classes in heaven to learn and change. Not to, to, to change from disobedience to obedience, never that, but from understanding of issues that were not clear. Will Martin Luther be in heaven? I hope so. I want to talk to Martin Luther, who said, concerning Sunday, there's not re no real evidence for it, but then never changed on Sunday. It was a friend of his, Karlstadt, that came to Martin Luther and said, there's just no evidence in the Bible. And, that, and he said, concerning Sunday, there's, uh, there's no evidence for it. Martin Luther heard that. It penetrated his mind, but it didn't change his life. Will he be there? Possibly. Depends on the light available. You know what? Truth is not just truth. Truth is when it comes home to my, my, my mind and I am convicted about it. Sometimes truth takes a while longer for some people than for others. Conviction is the issue for truth that God is going to judge. I am so glad God does the judging, let me tell you. Okay, let's see what else here. Uh, volume 1, Selected Messages, page 40. I saw the state of some who stood on present truth, but disregarded the visions, the way God had chosen to teach, in some cases, those who erred from Bible truth. I saw, now here's key, I saw that in striking against the visions, they did not strike against the worm, the feeble instrument that God spake through, but against the Holy Ghost. I saw it was a small thing to speak against the instrument, but it was dangerous to slight the words of God. I saw if they were in error, and God chose to show them their errors through visions, and they disregarded the teachings of God through visions, they would be left to take their own way and run in the way of error and think they were right until they would find it out too late. All right, let's make this practical. Let's take an example. Who was the first called prophet of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it wasn't Ellen White? Hey, you got it, Pastor. <laughs> William Foy, a black man. That's right. And he was called by God with some visions. Okay? Here's a little summary that someone... We don't have much information about William Foy, by the way. He's dropped mostly out of the Adventist wavelength. January 18, 1842, William Foy went to prayer meeting. Nothing strange about that. He was the pastor of a church. He a young, powerful African-American preacher who loved to tell others about Jesus. As William began to pray during one part of the service, he fainted. Frightened worshipers rushed out to find a doctor. The doctor turned pale as he examined William. William wasn't breathing, but somehow he seemed to have a normal heartbeat. What do you think was going on there? How you folks who know about how those came to Ellen White? That's right. First vision lasted two and a half hours. Sounds again like some that came to Ellen White. Yeah. 
Of course, everyone there wanted to hear what William had seen. None of them had seen such a strange sight, but he didn't really want to talk about what he was seeing. He was afraid no one would believe him, just a crazy young preacher. One month later, he had a second vision. And three days after that, he was invited to share his vision in a large church. How will I speak to a church filled with hundreds of strangers who do not look like me? Uh huh. So William did the only thing he knew to do when afraid. He prayed. As William desperately prayed for courage, he seemed to hear a voice saying, I am with you. That was enough. William Foy overcame his fears, told of his visions. He described heaven, the judgment of the world, other events that would take place before Jesus comes again. And he had a lot of difficult times, but he kept talking about those visions. He was willing to do that. Now here's the thing with William Foy. We really don't know how this all ended up for him. He did not become prominent as one who gave testimonies regarding his visions. He wrote some things down, he spoke to people, and then he just stopped doing it. And I haven't read anything so far that gives me a clue as to why he stopped doing it. I don't know. All we know about William Foy is if you go to a certain church in a certain state and look for his gravestone, you will find it. William Foy. Will he be saved or lost? I haven't a clue. I don't know why he stopped giving the, the visions. Only God can tell that. That is not our job. So that was the first time. What was the second time? The second person God called to be a prophet? Hazen Foss. Now you know more about Hazen Foss, don't you? We all know more about him. He was a young Millerite preacher, really strong, preaching the soon coming of Jesus Christ on October 22, 1844. And um, he got three visions. Well, I should say he got a vision about three things. That's probably more accurate to say. And uh, he didn't give them. He didn't give them. Because, you see, this was just weeks before October 22, 1844, that he got visions about something called the three messages that had to go to the entire world. And he said, how can that happen? We're just weeks away from the second coming of Christ. We don't have time to get into the printing presses. We don't have time to do anything. No, this message isn't from God. It can't be from God because it disagreed with his theology, you see. And again, I'm not going to judge him, but I'm going to tell you a story. One day, Ellen White was giving her visions. And unknown to her, Hazen Foss was in that room right over there listening to what she was saying. He didn't want to be identified, but he was listening to what she was saying. After the meeting was all over and uh, there, were no, there was no one around, he came to Ellen and said, you know what, Ellen, you just better keep on preaching what you're preaching and giving the visions because those are the exact visions that came to me. And I was afraid because my theology wasn't in harmony with that. They couldn't be from God. And the Holy Spirit has left me. I have no more interest in religion. And to our knowledge, he didn't change from that. Now, I don't know. He may have changed, and I hope he did. But he lost his zeal for preaching the word of God because he would not obey God when God came to him and said, this is my job for you, Hazen. And he said, no, not me. Choose someone else. Guess what the Lord does? Two times refused. He quits. <laughs> not our God not our God he doesn't give up on any one of us does he and so here comes the third choice now here we're coming to a choice that you and I would never have recommended I mean this choice that God was making right now first of all a woman in that time remember 1800s and um, well-educated, right? <laughs> Three grades, maybe. Remember her story of almost dying from a wound from her friend. And um, very, some friend. some friend, that's right. With friends like that, who needs enemies, huh? All right, and so here, here uh, he chooses a woman 
uneducated. And how about her health? It's terrible health and since, since that day that she got hit in the head with the rock. So here was a woman in poor health. Remember, even later in life, she never felt really strong. And she would have some really good setbacks later in life. So how about God's third choice? Recommended? Oh, my goodness. How about if you had a committee from the General Conference recommending a prophet right now? <laughs> Where would that one be? Yes. True. She would be the ideal candidate yep. for a spiritualist medium. That's right. But yes. Case, not, so. <laughs> not so. But even so, even beyond that, uh, the ones that really led out in the temperance movement were mostly women, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. Have, have you ever felt, just ask your, I'm not asking for you to raise your hand. Have you ever felt like, why did God ever want me around? I can't do anything for him. Right. If you've ever felt that way, you know how Ellen White felt a good share of her life. In fact, when she was writing the book Early Writings, which was her, basically her first publication, um, she gave that book, the manuscript, to her assistants who would do what with that book? Change it all around, make it say what they wanted to say? No, they couldn't change it. What they could do is clear up the bad grammar because she had a lot of bad grammar right then. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case in the writing of The Desire of Ages, by the way, which is kind of interesting. You know, that's a long time later. And apparently she has improved greatly in her grammatical abilities by the 1890s. But at this point, when she was first given the messages, she had no confidence at all in her ability to write. So that is another issue. God, you know, the point is here, when God chooses someone to do his work, it is usually better off if that person isn't qualified to do that work. So it's all clear that God is the one in charge here, not that poor Joe back there. Yes. Yeah, there's another one. Yep. Barely functioning as an adult. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. All right. So let's see. Did I, no, we covered all page two, have we? I didn't do it. Okay. I think we've covered everything on page two that I wanted to. We're on page three. All right, you have read this statement. You have heard this statement. This is a very common statement. It's not in your outline. It's so common. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a what light? Lesser light. To lead men and women to the greater light. Let me read that again. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Very familiar statement. Lesser light, greater light. And by the way, for anyone who is interested, The Last Deception of Satan is in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 78, not in your outline. Volume 2, Selected Messages, page 78, The Last, de the last Deception of Satan, uh, Before the Lord Comes. All right, so again, let me, let me kind of phrase what that really means. I talked about denying, and I talked about lesser light. I had a book in my, and I still have it, uh, called The White Lie. Anybody remember The White Lie? All right. A professor by the name, well, a pastor, by the name of Walter Ray, R-E-A, wrote the book The White Lie and said that, God, that Ellen White was lying to us when she said she got these messages directly from God. No, she got them from Wiley, and she got it from this person, she got it from that person, they all wrote, and she copied what they wrote, and so therefore, she didn't get it from God. All right, the white lie, she lied to us. All right, 
That's not what we're talking about here, folks. We're not talking about a liar. This is not the issue. Lesser light is about a different issue. You have been accepted as a prophet. Okay? You've been accepted. You passed the tests of a prophet. But in that writing of the, of the material, you didn't say everything that the Lord said. You added some things to it. You filled it out a little bit. Because remember, prophets are not verbally inspired. Prophets are thought inspired, which means they have to put the words in their own language that they can understand and you can understand. And so uh, Ellen White wasn't verbally inspired. Therefore, maybe she put her own words in there. Maybe she has some of her own ideas in that. And my friends, that's what Desmond Ford did at Pacific Union College. He did not deny the writings of Ellen White. He accepted her as a prophet. He read from her constantly as in his public presentations. I was there, by the way, so I know a little bit about this. I was a teacher when he was a professor. He had come over from Australia. I was just a kid teacher. I was in barely in my 30s, and uh, he was the authority. He was the power figure as he had come across from Australia. And uh, he said things like this. Need some help? I hate to interrupt you. We're just going to switch mics here, switch brother. Mics. All right. Yeah, we're going to set you up on this. All right, let's do it. I apologize, everybody. We're just, uh, this, this mic is being a little finicky today. Are you forgiving? Are you tolerant? Eh. Yes. All right. I'll let you pick that up. Well, where was it at? Pacific Union College. Oh. Yeah. Test, test. Test. There we go. Okay. Test it. Yes, I was a teacher at Pacific Union College, just beginning my teaching career there. I was planning to teach there the rest of my life. I was not planning to be here ever. Understand that. This is not what God called me to do, I thought. And, uh, and so, yes, I was a teacher. I loved teaching. I would love the classroom. And, uh, and so uh, I had great students, especially ministerial students. Uh, in fact, during the very time that uh, Desmond Ford was there, I estimated that 80% of my ministerial students were sound and solid. Desmond Ford maybe got 20% of them. That's not a bad ratio, is it? Uh, I was really kind of surprised by that myself. All right, now, everybody can hear me again? All right. All right. <laughs> so I taught 11 years there, and things began to break apart. It was no longer comfortable for me to invite students into my office to talk to them about the dangers of Desmond Ford. And they did come, and I taught. Okay? So that uh, became a little bit uncomfortable in my situation. We didn't know what we were, let me just throw this in. We didn't know what we were doing when we left PUC. I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to go back into pastoring. That wasn't a choice I was, I was comfortable with. And uh, I didn't want to go overseas. I could have gone to some overseas colleges. I could have done that. Uh, and so I said, look, I'm going to buy a motorhome, kind of like the one we have here, its, it's predecessor. And, uh, and we're going to travel around the country, and I'm going to visit various places I've never even thought of before in my life called self-supporting institutions. Yeah, well, that was an interesting year. Came down to uh, uh, Southern California and uh, presented a series at Loma Linda University. And, uh, we, uh, we was actually in the women's uh, chapel at Lamson Hall. And, Des and uh, Joe, Cru Joe Cruz was there. Joe Cruz was there. Next day, he calls me and says, I got a proposal for you. Why don't you join Amazing Facts? That was back in 1986. 1986. And I thought about it for a while, and I said, now, Joe, I have one pre... Uh, Precondition here. I'm not going to do what you do. What you do is you get up on Friday morning and you fly over to there and you give your presentations and then you fly back on Sunday night and you do the work of amazing facts all week long. And then you fly over to the next meeting. I said, I'm not going to do that. If you want me to join amazing facts, I've got a motorhome and I travel with my wife and we go wherever the motorhome will take us. That's why she accepted. 
That's one precondition. So it doesn't matter where you live. You're out on the road talking to people. That's all that matters. So he was very generous in that. And he was someone that believed, let me tell you this, in the truth of God. He was someone who was a faithful minister for God. I lamented the day when he died. I said, that's it, amazing fact, was going down the drain. Thankful, thankful, thankful. The Lord said, no, it isn't. And we are still functioning today. And I praise the Lord for that. So anyway, that's totally irrelevant to our subject. All right? Just throw it in. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> All right. A freebie from freebie. That's right. There you go. Let's see, what else do I want to share with you? The, la the, um, the little heed is given to the Bible. That's where we're at. The Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Almost all Adventists have misunderstood that statement. This is an issue that we've got to come to grips with and understand what the Lord was meaning with that statement in its context. And so what I'm going to do, I think we have this, Matthew, in the slides now. Yeah, if we can get the slides going. I have the clicker somewhere here. There it is over there. Point it your direction, is that right? Up. Oh. Maybe that's not it. That way? Other direction. There we are. All right. If a teaching is truth, where does it ultimately come from? What if the person doesn't aspire to be a prophet? If it's true, it still comes from God, right? Can a foreign being who doesn't believe in the God of heaven receive truth? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, did he receive some truth? But he came to admit it later that this came from God. But all of that, you know the whole story of that. So here at this point, we have all truth coming from God. Babe, what do they do? The other way. I'm going backwards again. What's the deal? All right, there we are now. Forward? Forward. Okay. Moses. Something very unique about Moses. Have you figured out that Moses is not like any other prophet that has ever existed? There was nothing in written material before Moses, was there? that we are aware of. It was all verbal. Why verbal? Because their minds were a little sharper than our minds. were. Their minds could remember everything, I'm sure of that. And when something came to them, they knew it. Their minds were maybe 10 times more powerful than our minds are functioning. I don't know. But Moses was given a message from God to give to his people in those earlier years of our planet's history. And when he gave the messages, the people figured out very quickly that those messages came from God because they saw the results of what, what was happening. Well, how did that work? Moses solved the problem for the Israelite people for the rest of their history. Didn't quite do that, did it? Instead, they started to come up with, well, we can add the worship of this god. What is her name? Ishtar? That was kind of a fascinating worship. Maybe we can adapt some of her material on our high hills and meet with, our, meet with God that way. Well, you know how that worked out. So we go on. Does God give up? Key question. Does God give up? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and they represent all of the Old Testament prophets now. Now they have two jobs to do. Every prophet after Moses has two jobs to do. Number one, you give the message that, the God, that God gave you. That's the really important one. How can you tell if it's from God? Were there other claimants to this same gift that were not from God at the same time that the ones were speaking from God? How could you tell the difference between, let's say, Micaiah and Micah? Micaiah is a false prophet. Micah is a true prophet. How could you tell the difference between a true and a false prophet. What was your job to do? All right? How could you be sure of what God was saying? 
All right. Did you have some previous, in, uh, now we're going to see, we're not talking about Moses, remember. Moses had now come into print. Well, print is not the word. It was careful copying, word by word, letter by letter. All right? Moses was their Bible. In fact, if you were to go to some of the um, villages in Palestine today, the Christian villages, uh, <clears throat> and ask them to show you their Bible, what do you think they would show you? Some would show you the five books of Moses, the Torah. That would be their Bible because Moses had written it. Not Isaiah, not Jeremiah, those we're not sure about. But Moses, we're sure about. All right, so Moses is the Bible. Moses is the authority. Moses is the one that you cannot contradict because his messages come from God. So if Isaiah is preaching and Isaiah says something that is totally contradictory to the writings of Moses, what would you identify Mo Isaiah to be? A false prophet. That's really the only way you and I have to identify things, right? Yeah, sometimes you can watch a person's life, but remember, some of these are centuries old. They're long off the scene. So Moses was the authority by which Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all of the Old Testament prophets were judged as authority. One by one, they came into the Bible, the canon, we call it, the books that were inspired by God. And so they are now functioning in that way. All right, let's go a step farther. Did that solve the problem? Did it? Didn't solve anything, did it? So now we're coming to the time of Christ and past. And Paul up there represents all of the New Testament writers. God again didn't quit. This time he started a whole new branch of, Christ, of, of Judaism called Christianity. It did come out of Judaism. And Paul represents all of those who are writing because what did he tell the, the believers in Berea to do? Check their Bibles to see if his writings were true. Check your authority. Always go back to your primary authority. When you have passed that authority check, then you are legitimate as a prophet. That's the key issue that we're dealing with right here. All right, so each one of those. Now let me ask you a question. If you are in Jeremiah's time, and you are hearing Jeremiah talk to you about uh, surrender to the Babylonians, it'll make it a lot easier for you. Totally opposite to what the princes were saying. Surrender to the Babylonians, from God or not from God. Which are you going to choose? How do you know? Again, he has to pass. Daniel has to pass. Jeremiah has to pass the test. Everyone has to pass the test of the previous inspired word. All right? So that, that becomes the authority by which all later people have to be checked. All right? So there you have how God inspired the Bible. One more this time, 18 centuries have passed. Ellen White, a young, uninspi un uninspiring person, is given vision. And she says it's the lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Can you safely say about the writings of Paul, Paul is a lesser light, I don't have to worry so much about him. Didn't he have to be checked by the whole Bible, the Old Testament? Was he lesser too? and checked by the Old Testament, lesser in terms of ability to speak for God on his own, but equal to all of the previous writings in his truth, if he passes the test. Let me restate that and make sure there's no question about it. Lesser, in, in the way Ellen White is referring to the word lesser light, is always based on being less than the final authority. I am always less than the Bible. Where did she always tell people to go if they had a question? To the Bible. That was consistent throughout her ministry. Go to the Bible. In fact, she would say on a couple of occasions, don't come to me with your question. Go to the Bible. Let the Bible be your authority. I am not your authority. So she would say that. So the key, quest, the key issue is, where does the final authority lie? Well, it, li it lay in Moses first. Then it lay in the Old Testament prophets. Finally, it laid in the New Testament. And now we've come to Ellen White. So 
friend's lesser light has nothing to do with authority. Lesser light has nothing to do with whether you'll be judged by what the lesser light says. Lesser light has to do only with where the, where, where the decision is made as to whether a prophet is true or false. That's what lesser is all about. And Ellen White never claimed for herself to be another Bible. But, again, let me go back to the, to the Old Testament. When, I, when Elijah came talking to King Ahab about what was wrong with Israel and what needed to be changed, where did Ahab, where, did, what, where could Ahab go to check it out? I don't think he was a faithful Bible student, but he had to decide right on the spot, virtually, whether, I, whether Elijah was telling him the truth or was lying to him. So again, it is not about whether the prophet is speaking words from God. It is where the prophet is checked by to become a prophet of God. So, little heed is given to the Bible. The Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. All right. Back to page three. Here we come to the interesting part. Doctrinal authority. Authority, key word. Selected messages. Volume, set, uh, volume one, page 206 and 207. When they, they, these are the people studying the Bible. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision, and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus, light was given that helped us to understand the Scriptures in regard to Christ, His mission, and His priesthood. A line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. You just heard her describe the last half of the book of Great Controversy there, right? That, uh, that section right in the last part. Okay, here we are. When did the Lord step in to give Ellen White special vision? Key point, when? What does it say in the statement? when they could do nothing more. They had studied. They had prayed. They had fasted way beyond what we do when we study things like this. And they could come to no conclusion. I wonder, I just wonder, maybe, and I'm going to ask some questions in heaven. Did we have problems with the state of man in death for a while? Was that a struggle for those early pioneers? Did we have uh, questions about the hellfire burning forever? Because it kind of doesn't it say that in some verses, and you have to work through those verses. Um, I, I, I am really wanting to, my curiosity to be satisfied by my guardian angel. When did we get the real clear, clear understanding? At what point? Did we do it just because Ellen White got a vision and we trusted her? I would be happy with that if that's the way it came. But I would be also happy if some were saying, no, I just don't get that doctrine. I don't find that doctrine in the Bible. I'm uncomfortable with that doctrine. I can't disprove it, but I don't know. Yes, sir. All right. You have just hit a key point. I'm going to read you some statements. Pardon? Well, sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yes. No, they didn't do it the lazy way. They did it the profound way. I'm going to read you those statements you're talking about right now. I want you to... I know. Yeah, that's right. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 207. During this whole time, what time are we talking about? We're talking about the time when our pioneers were studying the doctrines. How many doctrines do we have? Well, we have 29. Uh, how many doctrines do we start out with? Probably four or five. I don't know. I'd love to know all that. During this whole time, I could not understand the reasoning of the brethren. My mind was locked, as it were, and I could not comprehend the meaning of the scriptures we were studying. This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. Here you have a prophet who can't understand what the people are saying about studying the Bible. 
This was one of the greatest sorrows of my life. I was in this condition of mind until all the principal points of our faith were made clear to our minds in harmony with the Word of God. The brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters, and they accepted as light direct from heaven the revelations given. Isn't that remarkable? There are people just like you and me, a bunch of skeptics, trying to figure it out, sort out what teachings are true and what teachings are false. Yeah. Yes. Another one, Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 38. In the early days of the message, when our numbers were few, we studied diligently to understand the meaning of many scriptures. At times, it seemed as if no explanation could be given. Did you know that's how our doctrines came to us? No explanations were clear. My mind seemed to be locked to an understanding of the word. But when our brethren who had assembled for study came to a point where they could go no further and had recourse to earnest prayer, the Spirit of God would rest upon me and I would be taken off in vision and be instructed in regard to the relation of Scripture to Scripture. These experiences, catch this, were repeated over and over and over again. This is not a one-time shock. Thus, many truths of the third angel's message were established point by point. The brethren knew that when not in vision, I could not understand these matters. So, why does God block Ellen White's mind right here? Because God did that. She didn't just lose her memory. God blocked her mind. Why do you think God did that? That's right. Your thought, too? Same thing. In other words, how could you tell that this was not her own idea? By this time, they had had enough experience, apparently, to know that when she got something, that she was getting it from God, not Satan, or her own mind, either one. And uh, all of a sudden, something came very clear to those brethren locked in. When I say brethren, sisters, too, yes. When those people locked in, in discussion about the doctrines. I want to know. I want to know when I get to heaven and have plenty of time to think and talk. Not like now. I want to know which doctrines came to us directly from the Bible in those early meetings that were crystal clear from the Bible and were the way we were going to go, and which doctrines that we hold today as true came by a slow process of working through ideas and wondering and maybe not getting things right the first time around. How many doctrines have we been saved from because of the visions of Ellen White? I really wonder which ones we were a little iffy about and would have been losing our way. Let's see, is that all I wanted to say? For two or three years, my mind continued to be locked to the scriptures. I was asking the Lord to unlock my mind that I might understand his word. Suddenly, suddenly, I seem to be enshrouded in clear, beautiful light. And ever since, the scriptures have been an open book to me. That's pretty amazing material as a testimony. Manuscript 135, 1903. It was the period of 1848 to 1850 that she described her mind as locked. And she could not understand just Bible study stuff. Bible study stuff. Manuscript. Let's see. This one, as I said, was 135, 1903. I am not aware if it might be printed elsewhere. All right, so now let's read those statements at the top of page three. With that in mind, what lesser light is, what greater light is. Testimonies, volume five, 665. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the hearts of inspiration, the truths of inspiration already revealed. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word, yet but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has, through the testimony, simplified, key word, simplified the great truths already given, and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. So key point, no new truths are coming down the line here that have never been discussed before. This is simplifying the truths that are already there that we couldn't really grasp well and understand. That, it, yeah, right here is a really crucial way to understand the new, oh, what shall I phrase it as? The new theories that are coming into bear as to what uh, is going to happen in the next five years, etc. You know, you've heard those. 
All right, one other one here. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's. All right, go down a little farther. I'm going to go to A Word to the Little Flock, pages 11 and 12. We talked about a thousand years separating the two literal resurrections. We talked about that Satan was loosed at the end of that. All of that, you know, I just put them in here because these were all part of the doctrinal understanding of the very beginning. Okay, now we're going to go to page four. You can read those on your own. Page four. Really interesting here. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, pages 80, 97 to 99. Our first conference was at Volney and Brother Arnold's Barn. There's a place to hold Bible study. That's what they were doing during those years. You got a barn? Yeah, come on over. There were about 35 present, all that could be collected in that part of the state. There were hardly two agreed. Each was strenuous for his views, declaring that they were according to the Bible. Brother Arnold held that the thousand years of Revelation 20 were in the past, and that the 144,000 were those raised at Christ's resurrection. And as we had the emblem of our dying Lord before us and was about to commemorate his sufferings, Brother Arnold arose and said he had no faith in what we were about to do, that the sacrament was a continuation of the Passover to be observed but once a year. These strange differences of opinion rolled a heavy weight upon me, especially as Brother Arnold spoke of the thousand years being in the past. I knew that he was in error, and great grief pressed my spirit. The light of heaven rested upon me. I was soon lost to earthly things. My accompanying angel presented before me some of the errors of those present, and also the truth in contrast with their errors, that these discordant views which they claimed to be according to the Bible were only according to their opinion of the Bible, and that their errors must be yielded, and they unite upon the third angel's message. There you have the meeting in Brother Arnold's barn. What will we do now? What is Brother Arnold going to be doing right now? Let's just isolate ourselves on Brother Arnold, because that's what is mentioned here. Ellen White comes out of vision. She says, what you're teaching is wrong. You must stop teaching it. What is Brother Arnold going to respond to in that particular meeting? Remember, he's been studying this subject, he says, for years. This is not a new subject for him. This is something that he's well acquainted with. And now, a young, well, I don't know if she's probably around 20s right now, a young woman coming to him, telling him he must stop teaching what he's teaching. Couldn't Ellen White have given Brother Arnold, a 20-minute, 30-minute Bible study on the subject of why the, the millennium was the way it was and why the resurrections were the way they were. Couldn't she have done that? No, she couldn't. Because why? Her mind was locked to a study of the Word of God. She could not understand the scriptures they were reading. There was no way that Ellen White could, could, could say, well, this is what the Lord just said to me, and, uh, and I can give you a Bible study on it. Impossible. Bible study could not happen. All Brother Arnold had in for information was, this is a subject that uh, I've been studying for a long time. I think I'm right. Um, Ellen White has been coming to these meetings regularly for two or three years, and every time we've listened to her, we've done well. Every time we haven't, things haven't gone as well as we hope. I don't know. I better shut my mouth from here on in on this subject. Sometimes you just have to shut your mouth. Have you noticed that? You don't have to say, I confess, I was wrong. Sometimes it's, it's vital for us to just say nothing. Till we've sorted it out in our mind. Till we've had time to think about it. And the Lord has worked on our mind. How do I know that Brother Arnold said yes to God? Did you read the rest of the line? Our meeting ended victoriously. Truth gained the victory. Never would that have been written if Brother Arnold had walked out of that in a meeting in a fury. That would never have, have happened. So Brother Arnold, and did you notice it said earlier there were hardly two agreed? 
Do you suppose there were others in that meeting who had doctrines that they believed to be from God that Ellen White also referred to specifically? Brother Jones, what you're teaching is not right. You have to stop teaching that too. I am sure that there were a lot of negative statements from Ellen White to the people in that meeting. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. That's right. You know what the key in all of this is? A genuine spiritual relationship with God that you have and you have and you have. That's the key. In all of these areas, if you have a genuine working spiritual relationship with God, God, I, I've talked to people that are not theologically adept, okay? That uh, I'm not going to use any seminary language on. And I've talked to people that said to me, something about Desmond Ford doesn't seem right. But I don't know what it is. Because he was talking about salvation at the cross. He was talking about victory over sin. He was talking about the, the, God's plan for each one of us. He was talking about all the right things. But a wrong slant to them from the people that I talked to. I'm talking about my experience at Pacific Union College. And... Uh, I said, uh, how much time do you spend reading the writings of Ellen White? And they said, lots. We spent a lot of time. We studied them regularly every day. And I said, you know what's, what's been happening? The Lord has been impressing your mind through subjects that are totally unrelated to the subject that we're discussing right now from, from Dr. Ford. But the Lord has been impressing you. I have found, this is my testimony, I have found that those who are consistent readers of the spirit of prophecy, the writings of Ellen White, rarely get sucked into false teaching. They do. Some of them do. So I'm not going to make this 100%. Rarely get sucked into false teaching. So folks, even if you haven't figured out all of the issues involved, even if you didn't go to seminary and read the textbook like we had to, you can still be led by God 100%. And it isn't, I'll, just say, I'll say this, the truth isn't that hard to figure out. Have you noticed that when you really dig deep? The truth isn't that hard to figure out. It's only when you have some personal prejudices involved that things get bad. Just like Brother Arnold. I don't doubt for a minute. Here's what I'll tell you. If Brother Arnold had been cut down on his journey to one of these conferences that we're talking about here, the one in Valdi and Brother Arnold's barn, if he had been cut down at that moment, I might expect to see him in heaven. Remember, I'm not the judge. Very thankful. But the Lord knows where his heart was, where his spirit was, where his attitude was, and whether or not he could be taught in heaven. Because that's all that matters. Martin Luther will have to be taught in heaven if he gets there. He has to be teachable. You have to be teachable. I am getting more and more convinced that a good share of my teachings that I consider very important probably not going to be worth much at the uh, discussion table in heaven. And I'd better be ready for that. Now, I am not discouraging you to study the Bible. I want you to study the Bible, and I want you to come to convictions about what your Bible study leads you to. But even if your conviction is wrong and your heart is right, you will be in heaven. Okay? God is way more interested in our attitudes and our spirit than he is in our knowledge. Knowledge is always teachable. All right, here we are on page four. Uh, let's see what else I want to share. Uh, let's go to the very next one, Gospel Workers 302. At that time, that's a period of time, of course, one error after another pressed in upon us. Ministers and doctors brought in new doctrines. We would search the scriptures with much prayer, and the Holy Spirit would bring the truth to our minds. Sometimes whole nights would be devoted to searching the scriptures and earnestly asking God for guidance. How are we doing on that one? I haven't... <laughs> That's right. We are a little short on things like that. And uh, so, uh, earnestly asking God for guidance. Companies of devoted men and women assembled for this purpose. 
the power of God would come upon me, and I was enabled clearly to, key word, define what is truth and what is error. Here's an issue that you need to come to grips with at this point. Almost all of our publications that we have written do not say that Ellen White defined truth. They say she confirmed truth. Ellen White confirmed truth that had already been found by the pioneer. And she had a vision that they were on the right track, and she confirmed it by the vision. Well, that happens sometimes, but not all the time. And when those issues came up and Brother Arnold had to make a decision that day, sitting in that pew all by himself, he had to make a decision, do I trust the messenger? Do I trust the messenger? That may be the most important subject for us to understand today, and the one which will protect us from devious errors that Satan is going to bring among us. Have you noticed there are quite a few conspiracy theories floating around these days? Based not on fact, but on this leads to that, and maybe this will be the result. Which of those conspiracy theories are going to be from God and which from Satan? How can you tell? You better be very clear on these things because Satan is very smart. He knows how to put together ideas, facts, and get you to believe that something is going to happen that isn't going to happen. To put it very simply, there are a few that have passed mostly by, but they were strong during the time that we were involved in them. Uh, the feast, have you noticed that? study of the feast, that all of them must be kept again exactly in the same way except for the sacrifice of animals, feast keeping. I have no idea if some of you have been doing that. I have no idea, so I'm not talking personally to anyone. I have good friends, good friends, who were involved in these feast keeping activities. Some lost their positions over them. Remember, this was not just a minor thing. And uh, so how can we make a decision about things like that? How can we make a decision about which way the prophecies of Revelation are going to be fulfilled? Which comes first, which comes second, which comes third? And are the prophecies in Revelation continuous chronologically or separated in blocks chronologically? What I mean that you take a section of, the, of Revelation and you go from beginning to end, then you start over again in the next chapter and you go in the next per period. Is it chronological or sequential? Key point. How do you know the difference between the two? And if you don't know for sure, don't make a pronouncement that you're going to be embarrassed by down the line. Maybe it'd be better to be silent on some of those things. And repeat and enlarge. That's the key. Repeat and enlarge. That is the principle of revelation. Well, shall I throw another one out? This one is still going. This is not gone. <laughs> and what are you going to do about it? When someone comes to you saying, there's no evidence that the Holy Spirit is a person. There's no evidence that Jesus Christ existed for all from all eternity. There is no evidence that you worship three beings in heaven. You worship one being, and that is the only one you can be need to be responsible for. That one's still going pretty strong. Yep. And you're going to have to make a decision about that. Is it a conspiracy theory, or is it a truth that needs to be proclaimed? So that's why I'm saying this isn't all over with. You know, I'm using all of these old illustrations here to show how ideas came into their minds and what they were going to do with them, how they were going to handle them. And almost all of them that got them right said yes to the writings of Ellen White. Said yes to the writings of Ellen White. And that's where you and I can be kept safe right now. It is not hard to sort them out. Ones I've talked about and a few others as well. So conspiracy theories, be careful of, but don't, don't deny new life. Isn't that a tough one? You deny conspiracy theories if they're not based on the Word of God, but you must accept new light or else you're in trouble. And that's what kept us in this world for, what is it now, 130 years? Because the new light that was coming through Jones and Wagner and supported by Ellen White strongly was called heresy, was called danger. By the president of the General Conference. Yes. 
And so they had to make decisions. My great-grandfather had a tough time. You know what? I'm really glad I don't know what decision he made. Because I would probably misinterpret that decision completely and make it for the best and everything worked out fine for my great-grandfather. I don't know. And I'm really glad I don't know because God is the judge. He knows my great-grandfather's heart. My great-grandfather was a delegate to the 1888 General Conference in Minneapolis. His picture is right there. It's all there. So it doesn't matter who is or isn't there. What matters is, has God spoken on the subject? And in this case, it should have been so easy. Ellen White so often supported what Jones and Wagner were teaching as the word of God. Do not call it a, 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 a heresy, she would say. It is from God that the message has been given. So, new light, important, conspiracy, danger. You have to sort out which is which. And that's the way life is today. All right, let's see what else. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 32, halfway down page 4. The Lord has given me much light that I want the people to have, for there is instruction that the Lord has given me for his people. It is light that they should have, line upon line, did you notice? Precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. This is now to come before the people, because it has been given to correct specious errors and to specify what is truth. The Lord has revealed many things pointing out the truth, thus saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. And remember, that's the whole issue then, as well, on issues of the Day of Atonement. Remember, I read that statement earlier, that the Day of Atonement has the, we're the only church that teaches anything like that. We are totally unique in our belief about the Day of Atonement. And, uh, and all of that has to be sorted out in the same way that we have been discussing. All right, let's see. Uh, couple more down at the bottom of the page, Gospel Workers 307. The foundations of our faith were laid at the beginning of our work, notice, by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. What is the revelation? Visions from God given to his people. Ellen White, she was referring to herself there. All right, skip down to the second to the last line, the paragraph. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 52. There is one straight chain of truth without one heretical sentence in that which I have written. I am so glad a prophet wrote that because I am doubtful that I would have been able to say the same thing ever, now or in the future. Not one heretical sentence. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 84. All who believe that the Lord has spoken through Sister White and has given her a message will be what? Safe from the many delusions that will come in these last days. You remember how I started this whole thing? Those who are clear on this subject, the authority of the writings of Ellen White will probably make it through. And those who are not will be deceived. The theories will come along and we don't know what to do with it. Now, I'm done with the outline as such. I want to share a couple of things with you in addition. Um, we've always said that the Bible is our supreme authority, and that's exactly right. Sola Scriptura. We believe in that 100%. And so here is a statement that you have to evaluate. Uh, they did not receive these doctrines through the visions of Ellen White. Her major role during the development of their doctrines was to guide in the understanding of the Bible and to confirm conclusions reached through Bible study. Did you catch the word in there? Confirm. Remember what Ellen White said on one occasion? To define. Con defining is different than confirming. When you um, walk off a 30-story building, are you defining or confirming the law of gravity? See, there's nothing about a doubt there. That's a law that stands, and you can only confirm it by trying. Okay? When... Uh, uh, what's his name, Matthew? Einstein. Thank you. We've got a plaster on the back of our motorhome. Have you noticed? Have, did you read the back of our motorhome? <laughs> and what did it say? <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> when Einstein de declared his theory of relativity, that my son has evaluated, and I haven't, and I'm not going to. Okay? 
how will he be able to tell if Einstein was developing a new teaching or an established teaching that had never come to light before since we didn't have the right technology to get at it? How could you figure that out? Because Einstein was developing a new understanding. And uh, gravity is not a new understanding. Some things are settled, some things are locked in, and some other things have to be laid on the table for a little while until we can get it all sorted out. New light versus old teaching. All right, anything else? Oh, yes, yes, here's one. This was printed in Ministry Magazine in the 1950s. No doctrinal truth or prophetic interpretation ever came to this people through the spirit of prophecy, not in a single case. How about that? Ministry Magazine, 1950s. No truth, no prophetic interpretation, ever. Someone responded to that by the name of M. L. Andreas. And you know what, folks? He is the whipping boy for all of the ones in the quote-unquote new theology that are coming down the line. He is the one that you attack if you want to be on the safe side. Attack M. L. Andreas, and everybody does, okay? Keep that in mind. M. L. Andreas, and by the way, just by the way, the whole next period of time, we're going to go back to what M. L. Andreas said about the final atonement in the last generation. Here is what he said, I am charitable enough to believe that the brother who wrote in the ministry did not know any better, but if so, his ignorance was profound. The tendency in the article of the ministry is to downgrade Mrs. White. It would be more nearly true to say that many of our doctrines, including those of Christ's mission and priesthood, came to us as light direct from heaven through the vision. Are we humble enough to believe that? Because I think he's dead right when you examine our teachings and why, why we didn't get into the evangelical gospel. That was last year's theory. Why we didn't get into their prophetic interpretation. Why so many of them, and I'll just say this, and I'm not going to say any more about it, and I'm not going to take any questions about it. Why is it that so many evangelical believers throughout the Adventist, no, throughout the uh, Christian world here in the United States are so excited about Donald Trump being their next president. Now remember, I'm not saying if he's going to be a good one or a bad one. No, no opinions here. I'm not going to say. But why is it that they have locked on so definitely, and many in Adventism have done so too, I've noticed, some of our very close friends. How can you tell the difference between the dangerous, dangerous presidential possibility and the savior of the United States? Because that's the way he's portraying himself. If, I don't know if you noticed, what is the title, Matthew, of the, uh, or I guess there's no title to his last presentation on this subject. He spoke to evangelicals, and he told them that everything we had hoped to do in the previous election, we're going to do in this election. CPAC, that's it. It was CPAC. Yep. And so you, because you, that's been their problem. Uh, the, First of all, the evangelical world kind of locked into, uh, um, <laughs> don't get old, folks. <laughs> Who? Bush, yes, George W. George W. Bush. Why is it that so many of them locked into him? Because he was talking about the same issues. He was an evangelical believer, too. And so, yes, he's the man. He's the Cyrus who will bring us out. Well, it didn't work so well. Didn't make it. But this time, Cyrus is coming. Cyrus is here. He has been planned by the Lord. And everyone must get in line with Cyrus, the deliverer of God's people. And that's pretty much the way you have to decide. So how do you figure all that out? How do you sort it all out? By the way, just by the way, okay? You don't have to sort out anything about presidential election. You don't have to do that. If you choose to vote, that's fine for that man. But if you choose not to vote for that man, if you choose to vote for nobody, if you choose to vote for the other man, you're privileged. You are a free citizen of the United States yet. <laughs> yet. When will things change? That's always the issue. When will things change? And so uh, the whole issue here is that in some areas, you don't have to make choices. 
if you don't want to. You can decide for yourself. Okay, I have a whole other sermon on that. Let's see what else I want to share with you. This was a doctoral candidate in Germany in 1965, and she wrote a PhD thesis. Here's what she said. The SDAs still live on the spirit of Ellen White, and only as far as this heritage lives on do the Adventists have a future. Remember, she's not an Adventist. She's reflecting to Adventists what is important. Newsweek's religion editor, Kenneth Woodward, if it, the church, loses its founding mother, the church may find that it has lost its distinctive visionary soul. Other folks get it right. And we wonder if everything she said is really that important. And maybe we don't have to follow her teachings on diet. Oh, that's a hard one. Diet is such a tough one. Councils on diet and foods is just too picky. <laughs> Ministry of healing. So on all these areas, I'm getting back to the main point I started with. Do you trust God's messenger? I'm going to say without any question in my mind, she is God's messenger. That is settled with me. I'm not budging from that from now until the day I die. Now do I trust her enough to follow her? Because if God says it, it's really important. If God said it. If God told Ellen White to tell us, it's really important. And I can't say it's because she uh, didn't use the words in vision I saw. No, that doesn't do it. Because most of her writings do not use that language. And so do we trust what God showed her? And are we going to make it true? I hope everyone in this room is going to make it true. Seriously. I hope that everyone here is going to have a faith. Remember, it's not just about believing in Ellen White. It's about living a life in total harmony with God. 100%. Every day. The moment you get up in the morning, Lord, take this day. Use me during, during this day. If I make a mistake, clarify it for me. Help me. That's a decision that we can make. So I'm going to say, folks, that uh, this subject is not an off subject. It is a crucial subject for every Seventh-day Adventist to understand. 17% readership? Not going to cut it. Just not going to cut it. Will God find another prophet to take her place? Remember, she was asked that question. She said, the Lord has not given me any knowledge about that, but my writings are sufficient to carry us through until Jesus. And I'm satisfied with that. Listen, in all those books, I've got a pile of them on my library, if the earthquakes don't take them down. In California, her writings, way bigger than what I'm talking about right here, all her writings. And I believe in them, but they are not going to save me unless I practice what God has said in them. And remember, time and place. I taught, tell people who are wanting to move out to the country, go, but make sure the Lord has opened the door for you to go. Don't just go. Don't just assume everything will work out just fine. If the Lord opens the door, if the Lord makes it clear, then you should go. All right, are we done? Any further questions? I'll open it up for any general questions that you might have now. So the time is yours, and we'll close up when you're done. You're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Am I okay, Matthew? Ah, uh, yes, one more thing I was about to do. Um, there have been a number of attacks. Listen, if you go and type in Ellen White on uh, your website, uh, what are you going to find, most likely? Really? All negative. Yeah. You're saying it's get a little better? Ah. Oh, well, nice. I'm glad to hear that. Uh-huh. All right. It'll find the positive things. Okay. Ah, I see. All right. I see. I see. It depends on your search engines, does it? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, did Ellen White eat oysters? 
What if you look that one up? What do you think you're going to find? Oh, yeah, she did. No problem. Walter Martin said that. <laughs> on and on that kind of thing goes. So what I'm going to share with you right now is, is websites and books that will help you when questions come to you. It's up already. Very good. All right. When did I punch that? Someone back there did. All right. It did it. All right. So F.D. Nickel, her standard, the, the standard book that is still standard, folks. You don't have to be apologizing for his book. Ellen G. White and her critics. William Fagel, much more recent book, 101 Questions About Ellen White and Her Writings. Now, some people don't like to read books, particularly old books. So we have some websites that are on. And by the way, these are not official websites of the church. They, these, are, these are individuals just like you folks right here who have gone into a study of these things and have come to grips with some of the issues. EllenWhite.info, Ellen-White.com. If you put in Ellen White, you'll go to the official website. EllenWhiteAnswers.org. Those are some, and there are others, those are some of the websites that have come to grips with the objections of the Internet on Ellen White and her authority. And uh, so that's, that's something for you to... Take a picture of, write down, just remember that you can go to places to help out when you're stuck. Okay, let's pray and we're done. Father in heaven, we thank you, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for your additional help without which we would not be here in this belief system today. We thank you that in our pioneering days, you took pity on us when we could not understand and you gave us help so that we would not be left to flounder. Thank you, Lord. Now help us to be obedient. Once we have made the decision that this is from you, we are going to ask for power to live in, in harmony. So, Lord, take each one of us wherever we are. Take us step by step, one step closer to being that group known as the 144,000 who will vindicate your name and end the great controversy. Thank you in Jesus' name. All right, now we're going to take, how long now, Pastor, you tell me? Oh, I don't know, five or ten minutes. Uh, Sounds I good. Gotta, I got to run, but yeah. I've got a material I got to open up, so I will be back. Uh, don't think I'm shedding my memorial. He, he told me about that yes. quite a few weeks ago, and I said, no problem. Yeah, amen. amen. <laughs> You're good. Uh, yep, I will, uh, we'll be back. Uh, we'll take five, ten minute break, and then we'll yep. get back to the next session. Sounds good. Uh, I'll be back following this. Next session, what is the final atonement? That's a word that no other Christian group uses. Okay, thank you. All right. How about everybody will come back in a few minutes?